Welcome to Pre-Tower with K&M Technology Group. Here we will have discussions and presentations with technical specialists about topics or problems that are affecting the drilling industry today. We strive to keep the discussion strictly technical with no sales pitches for products or services. But since we are conducting a technical discussion, for context you should know who we are and what we do. K&M is an engineering consulting firm that specializes in complex and challenging wells. We began with a focus on extended reach wells and have evolved into a company that handles any type of challenging wells, be it unconventional, HPHT, deep water, deep TVD wells, and more. Our highly trained team provides engineering consulting, training and best practices, and field supervision. We also developed ERA, our proprietary torque, drag, hydraulics, and geomechanics software, which makes well planning more accurate and efficient. To learn more, please visit our website at www.kmtechnology.com. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Chris Cutts. I'm the general manager with K&M Technology Group. And uh, uh, I first of all want to thank you for joining in today. We, we unfortunately had to postpone our pre-tower from February due to the, uh, due to the winter storms that happened here in, in, in the Houston area and in Texas. So I hope that everybody that was impacted from that storm has, has recovered and they're, they're, they're doing better now. Um, and we want, really wanted to give everybody an opportunity to uh, focus on themselves and their families. And so we've decided to postpone our, our, our pre-tower discussion and move it to this month. And our, our guest today is Mr. Ross Loudon from uh, the, the surveying domain head from, from Slumberjay. So, Ross. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, uh, those of you who are, who are uh, listening. Um, what I really want to talk to you about today is the kind of impact of uh, well bore tortuosity on, on well construction. I'm going to go straight into it. Um, before we go any further, though, we have to kind of discuss what well bore tortuosity is. And this is in itself a contentious, perhaps not a contentious subject. People are, uh, people are um, aware that there's a thing called well bore tortuosity, but uh, there's lots of definitions. There's over 40 SP papers in the last five years just around tortuosity and, and its effects and how it's defined and so on and so forth. Um, which makes it a little bit difficult to come up with a nice, easy uh, catch-all phrase for what tortuosity is. And so there's no clear definition of what tortuosity is? No, no. Some people say it's the effective borehole diameter that you're trying to fit a tubular down. Some other people say it kind of depends what you're trying to do. You know, for if you were running an ESP, for instance, you might be interested in um, a, a single dog leg over a tangent section is what you're really interested in. And that to you would be tortuosity. For, for other people that's trying to run um, completions in an ERD well uh, with limited uh, capacity on, uh, torque capacity on the rig uh, or weight on the rig in order to get that um, that's, uh, completion to TT. So it kind of varies on uh, where, uh, what your standpoint is and what it is you're trying to do in your well bore. But, but um, you know, these, these changes in uh, position as you're drilling that well bore all add up to increased well all add up to tortuosity if you like we can't drill perfectly straight holes and we can't drill perfectly uh, curved curved sections so um we have to think about what that what that effect has and um there's some there's a lot of discussion if you like about soft string and um uh, hard string models soft string and uh, hard string models um in order to to work out what your torque and drag is, etc. But um, I'm not I'm not really I'm probably not qualified to talk about those things, and uh, I think you are far better qualified than I am, Chris. But at the end of the day, we do know that tortuosity exists, and having more deviation in your borehole than you plan for is going to have an impact on almost everything you do in that borehole, whether that be an increased friction factor or more time to run your casing, or um, you know, worst case scenario, you get your casing stuck or you can't get your completion to TD or you know, this is some of these more catastrophic uh, scenarios. So um, the little uh, diagram that I've got, well, the little picture that I've got here is a, if you like, a simple representation of what to some people tortuosity is. If you were to imagine the flatbed of that truck was um, was a piece of tubular and you're trying to get it around that corner, right? You're just going to get stuck. Unless you can make that tubular bend, you're going to get stuck. Or perhaps if you're lucky, um, the formation is very soft. Um, and you actually push, you actually, you can actually get pushed round that corner. But um, for the most part, when we um, 
my experience, when we hang up, you're literally getting stuck. That tubular's rammed itself into the formation and you're having to pull back and rotate and do it's whatever. Be, it's become a geometric problem. I'm a geometric problem, yeah. If you just don't have enough space to, well, either you don't have enough space to get around uh, or you're, um, you're trying to bend it beyond its, its normal bending capability. So uh, either way, it's not a good place for you to be. Um, and from a well construction uh, point of view, um, really, the, the questions are, you know, can, can the tubular fit down the wellbore? Um, and that would kind of talk about effective wellbore clearance and that, that the stiffness of the tubular itself, um, you know, uh, BHA is nice and limber. It's a general rule. So it can go and do things that the casing can't. Um, so we have, to be, we have to be aware of that. Uh, wellbore strength, I was just talking about that. Uh, you can actually end up in a situation where your casing turns into its own little bit and batters its way around um, all the sharp parts, let's call them the sharp points on your, your wellbore, and somehow you get to TD. But does that help? Um, what have you done to your tubular as you've done that? Have you damaged the, the casing? Have you buckled the casing? You know, these, these are difficult things to know. And if you don't know what your tortuosity is, you don't know what the, the actual shape of that wellbore is, it's a very difficult thing to say. But one, and the final thing is it's like cumulative energy. So, you know, whether we have a soft string model or a hard string model, we talk about friction factors. And if, if you, what tends to happen is if you have a lot of tortuosity in a well and you're measuring, um, you're measuring that tortuosity, well, you're measuring your, your torque required to get to TD, um, then what can end up happening is you, you, you say have a nominal friction factor 0.25. But by the time you've got to TD, it's gone up to 0.4, right? But it's all the same formation. The friction factor shouldn't be going up, right? The formation's not changing if you're horizontal, generally. Um, what's happening is that, that you're, you're, you're adjusting your friction factor because of tortuosity. Um, and and that, that, that becomes important because we don't have infinitely powerful rigs. Um, and you, you can run out of uh, torque to get down to TD and get your... Get your um, your casing run or whatever if you if you have to rotate your casing and so um i think it's quite important but one one point i think that's that's really important is tortuosity is not the same as rugosity so rugosity is this idea if you look at the um the little picture that we have here is this idea that you have a misshapen borehole so you're going from under gauge to well, engage to over gauge in a very so you've got breakout or something similar that can have an effect it can cause a ledge and you might get caught on a ledge but that's not the same as tortuosity um, and the only way you're going to see that is with a caliper. So it doesn't matter how often you survey. If you don't have a caliper, you're not going to see rugosity. And rugosity, um, you, we, you have to make some assumptions about the shape of the borehole when you're drilling. Now, interestingly enough, generally, the more tortuous the borehole, the harder the DD's working in order to keep on um, a particular well path. Perhaps with stringers, you're bouncing off a stringer, um, and then having to push back down, punch the way through that layer. In the process of doing all that, Every time you make a big steering setting, especially with a motor, you're going to have a um, you're, going to, you're going to build a, a little ledge. Um, self and a, a guy called Ed Stockhausen and Bill Lesso um, did a little experiment and uh, showed that if you uh, if you take a motor from um, rotate and go straight to high side, you actually build a little ledge. And it's not a little ledge; it's a big ledge. Um, it's very short lived, but it's you know the, the dog leg is enormous and if you were continuously doing that, you really will be cutting down any effective uh, diameter in your borehole. And, you know, pipe is not infinitely flexible, so it, it will have an effect eventually. So. so you're saying if a directional driller is actively is actively steering continuously, then that's going to cause them to have to continue active, actively steer even more as they go because they're it, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy, like you're on this hamster wheel that... Well, I, I possibly, yeah. So one of the problems, I guess, with the directional for a directional driller would be you hit, you go horizontal, and you hit a, um, you hit a string, and you bounce off the stringer. Then you make, um, you make a correction. You try to punch through that layer, and you bounce off again. And what happens is you, you have this sort of. Uh, hopefully, you can see my hand. You can. You get this kind of porpoising effect, and um, that that porpoising effect can be um, very significant uh, in terms of wellbore tortuosity. And also, it can be very significant in terms of um, uh, the actual wellbore placement, which we'll come on to in a in a moment. But but you are you're just adding, you're you're minimising the amount of available wellbore clearance you've got to run whatever tubulars you want to run afterwards. So you might get the drill string back out, 
which is fair enough. But the drill string is, you know, uh, an eight and a half inch hole, you might have a five inch drill string, five and a half inch drill string, and it's fairly flexible. But then you're going to go and try and run really rigid casing. Uh, and that's where you might end up with some, some problems. So th this brings me up to my next question, because you've got, for well construction, can the tubular fit into the borehole and the effective well bore clearance? When I see those, I kind of think that they both mean the same thing, but you've got them separated out. So in your opinion, they must be, they must mean slightly different things. So what, what is different about those two? So there's an assumption when we go to plan uh, to run your tubulars. There's, there's always an assumption that your borehole is straight. Um, uh, the borehole is always straight. So uh, we end up in this situation where if you get a lot of tortuosity, your effective borehole diameter changes. But if you don't measure that tortuosity, so you're not aware of it, you still think it's straight. Um, and, and you get hung up or you, you have difficulties getting through a particular section in the well. Um, and that's why I sort of separate them out. We, we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the stiffness of the tubular and we make models based on perhaps past experience and friction factors and so on and so forth. But the point is that the tortuosity can be far, far worse than that if you happen to get into a, a difficult situation with the, the shape of the borehole uh, or, or the difficult situation from a directional drilling point of view and you're, you're, you're um, trying to push through layers and, and doing an awful lot of steering um, that you've not modelled up front. So your effective borehole diameter is different to what you assumed in the first place. So you get yourself into trouble and you don't know why this is happening. Um, you know, we often just add some more digits to the friction factor when in fact that's probably not helpful because it's for the next well that friction factor could be totally different because you you have redesigned the bit and it punches straight through the layer so you just don't have that porpoising effect for instance um, and then people get confused as to why this well in the same in the same field going through the same formations has got totally different friction factor to the, the well beside it this adds to confusion i think interesting so we have a question from the audience How did the truck get around the bend? Uh, that's uh, that's interesting. What I think happened is the you can see the um, the digger at the back. I think it lifted up the back of the truck, pushed the back of the truck as far over to the um, uh, far over to the right hand side as it could, um, and then the truck just moved slightly further forward and they just sort of edged their way around. Inchworm their way around it. Wormed their way around it. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we can't deploy diggers downhill, so that's. Uh, unfortunate but there you go thanks for the question though okay we'll go to the next. yeah sorry next slide um so how do we measure tortuosity so it's normally measured or described as a um as a some kind of measure of dog leg per hundred feet that would be the simplest possible measure and um, obviously this is very frequency uh, survey frequency sensitive if you surveyed it surveyed every 500 feet you would have you would have the most amazingly tiny amounts of uh, dog leg severity and, and therefore perceived tortuosity. But that's not real. Um, we're constantly moving, that BHA is constantly moving around. And, and um, if you don't take account of that, you end up in, with, with hidden dog legs, you end up in, in difficult situations where you don't know what, um, uh, you don't truly understand what's happening down home. Um, so it's, it is very, very survey frequency sensitive. Now, you can go, so if you drilled every third stand, you could make your borehole look amazing. If you surveyed every foot, you can make it look appalling. Um, and there's a, there's a happy medium to be had between the two of them. And, you know, I, I can go into that if, if, if people are interested. But really, how we measure um, well we're tortuosity is it's, the easiest way to think of it is like a cumulative dog leg, right? So you've got, you have all these individual dog legs, one after the other, and, and you accumulate them all together and you work at a, a, a degree per 100 feet of, of dog leg. So it's almost an average per 100 feet. Um, but that, that's not truly, so one big dog leg in the middle of a tangent section does not, does not mean that the well is infinitely tortuous and very difficult to drill. We'll come on to that in a minute. So there's a, this idea of of an average angle, which is where you try and um, you try and average the you take the cumulative dog leg and you try and average these dog legs out 
so the the change in dog legs out um, and that's that's a step forward but it's still only one small step forward we still haven't talked about the amount of energy they required to get that um, tubular down the hole so you can talk about elastic energy that is all driven by bending moments and um, there's something that uh, an SP paper that myself and a guy called Sjord Bands came up with which is called the cumulative tortuosity index I have to say Sjord was the, the, the guy who came up with the maths um, but basically what we're trying to do is bring up the bring in this idea of take the dog leg, take the bending moments, work out what the, the energy required to actually get to TD is going to be. And um, we thought we were very, very clever coming up with this. And I'll come on to why we thought we were clever in a minute. Um, it turned out we were wrong. But that's that's fine. That's all this, this, the, the process of learning. But um, if we're to look at, at tortuosity and how we might measure it, um, my mouse here is showing four different um, representations of a borehole. Now, Representation one and two, you've got quite a lot of effective clearance. So one is one is a perfect case scenario where you have a beautifully smooth curves. Are these all the same well? No. So oh. these are just representations. Okay. Um, I would, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we could probably do that with caliper data that we have, but um, I would hope that we don't end up in this situation with four different, I, I, I'm, it would be worrying if I ended up in this, we ended up in this situation with, um, four different wells having these four different types of boreholes. But um, one and two, what you have, you can see there's some clear, despite the fact on, on number one, you've got a lovely smooth borehole, what appears to be a smooth borehole. Um, the bit's doing its job. There's no um, no uh, no breakout. Formation's nice and smooth. Maybe you're drilling through sandstone or something like that. It's quite slow, but it's very clean. Number two is uh, not nearly as clean. So the top and bottom of the hole are a bit um, rogus. Um, you still have plenty of effective borehole diameter. So actually between one and two, it wouldn't matter um, whether the, whether you've got rugosity or or you know or a perfectly smooth borehole. You're not really going to have any problems running your casing down. But where it all goes wrong is where you have situations three and four. So in situation three, you, you're effective borehole diameter because you have so much change in um, effective. It's not actually change in dog leg. Dog leg is an indication of a change in position. You have so much change in position through that well bore your effective borehole diameter is tiny, right? And you're going to struggle at these at these points that I'm pointing out here. You're going to struggle to get um, casing past those points unless it's soft formation and you can just push straight through it. And for the most part, we must be in that situation or we'd hang up pipe far more often than we do. Because to be honest, we probably drill far more wells like this than we do completely straight wells, especially in a curved section with the, the, the DDs fighting to, um, to, to build a curve. And um, in... in Number four, what we have here is what it would be, you have rugosity causing you a problem, but that's not tortuosity. It's a bit different. It acts like tortuosity, but it's a bit different. So you're going from, from um, even under gauge to over gauge over and over and over again. Um, so that might be shock and vibration. There's lots of different reasons that might happen. Well-born well stability. Well-born stability, et cetera. Um, but the point is your effective borehole diameter is almost nothing. So you're really going to struggle to... Um, get the well bore down, and possibly if you push really hard, you're going to end up buckling the buckling the casing in the first place, and that's obviously very very undesirable thing for us to happen. Yeah, if your if your borehole isn't is enlarged, then the, the the buckling tendency or the buckling resistance goes down, and the right. likelihood of you buckling the pipe obviously goes up. Um, with regards to to tortuosity, is is tortuosity going to be how is it going to be impacted by the stiffness of the drill string? Let's say you're drilling an eight and a half inch hole with a similar BHA, but you go but you were going to drill it with Drill one well with five and a half inch, one well with five inch, and one well with four and a half inch drill pipe. Is using the more limber or less stiff drill pipe going to have an impact on on tortuosity? Assuming that the rest of the parameters are kept the same. So I think um, if we talk about tortuosity, whilst we're drilling the well, um, the 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 BHA itself tends to be reasonably limber. So most BHAs are designed to even high end. Uh, high-end BHAs with lots of LWD type equipment in it are designed to get up to about 15 degrees per hundred of, of um, uh, dog legs. So that's quite a big bend, right? And it's relatively difficult to do with a rotor steerable tool, for instance. Um, so we, uh, I think when we're drilling, we have much less of a problem with tortuosity. It's what we're trying to put into the hole after, which is far more stiff like the, the casing or the completion, or, or we're very concerned about running an ESP or something along those lines. I think that's 
when we're drilling tortuosity is is less of an issue. Your tortuosities, you might end up running out of torque towards the end of a well to to, to get to your TD. But in terms of getting back out of hole, um, you're normally you're normally reasonably okay. Where I think tortuosity really has an effect is when you're trying to do something a bit different, like um, running casing, running completions, running an ESP, um, doing downhole operations where you just don't know. Um, or actually, there's there's been an, a nice SP paper about this, where where by knowing your torch velocity up front, so using all the information you have from a surveying perspective up front, um, they managed to increase the lateral length of a set of wells by 17%. So 17% more production, or more productive zone, I should say, um, for those wells than they had before. Because what they were doing before was they had a um, a conception that they needed to have a safety margin they didn't want to get. They didn't want to get to the point where the, the they ran out of torque and they couldn't. They were going to struggle to get the BHA back out of hole. So, um, in that case, I think you know the more limber BHA, perhaps that would be easier to um, to. I, I, I don't. I'm not sure that the more limber BHA is going. Are you asking? Is it going to make the borehole less tortuous, or it's just not going to have as much of a fit? I was asking more on the drill pipe side. On drill pipe side. Okay. Yeah. So it would would having a stiffer drill string may make tortuosity higher or lower or the same given that the the formation the bha the bit the drilling parameters all of those things more or less stay more or less stayed constant so normally the drill string is uh, even even if you had a lot of heavyweight drill pipe and all yeah. that sort of stuff the drill string is still not as stiff as the bha that's doing the drilling in the first place um cuz even at 5 inches um you wouldn't be running that in a in a 6 inch hole so uh, at five inches, you would be um, in an eight and a half inch hole. The BHA itself, and that BHA might be four or five hundred feet long, will be far more stiff than the the. the so the it's the BHA binding. that's driving it, not the drill string. Not the drill string. Yeah, sorry. And what about with regards to stabilization? How how is if you like? I'm assuming that if you have an unstabilized slick BHA, that you're going to see a higher degree of tortuosity than if you have a very well stabilized BHA. Is yes. that true or is that incorrect? Well. Uh, or is it somewhere in between? I think it's, it, it, it depends. It's the, <laughs> uh, the, the famous answer, it depends. And I think uh, there's, there's DDs out there who can, DDs and drilling engineers out there who can, who can discuss this far better than I can. But as a general rule, um, if you have a much stiffer BHA, so for instance, there is, um, there's a tool uh, that, that I've seen, a very high dog leg rotor seedable tool. Um, that if it's if it's let loose can can produce astonishing levels of tortuosity. You've got to take it. You've got to take real control uh, and, and be on top of what that tool's doing all the time. So and it is limber, right? Um, especially in small hole sizes. So I think there there is something to that. That the the you you, you have to have a balance between what dog leg you want. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to drill straight, um, if you wanted to drill a uh, 15, degree, uh, 15 degree curve to land laterally, uh, you're not going to take that same BHA and try and drill the lateral, right? Because if you try to do the lateral, it would go all over the place. It would be almost impossible to control with a motor. Um, and the same thing can happen with a, with a you know, uh, the same thing can happen if you like um, from a, a, a stiff or a limber BHA. That stiffer BHA isn't going to get a 15 degree dog leg, so you're going to have to swap out BHAs. It's kind of horses for courses in terms of the, the BHA configuration. Okay. So this, this probably also is, an, is a, may, may be one of the factors as to why we see different friction factors when you go to, when you go to pull out of the hole with a, with a BHA or run in the hole with a, with a BHA, assuming that the hole is clean, assuming that you've removed all the cuttings and you don't have any interaction with cuttings. If you remove the BHA out of the hole and then you go to run your casing or your liner, that we we typically see a higher level of friction when you're going to run casing or liner compared to running a drill string in the same hole using the same mud in the same formation, same everything. So that additional level of friction, in in my opinion, or at least part of it, is attributed to that stiffness effect that most drilling engineering programs or soft string programs, because they're a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, they don't require the same level of computational power, but also if we're not taking the appropriate number of survey points and we don't have an accurate description of the wellbore, then a strifting model sometimes isn't, isn't going to tell us what we want to, what we want to know anyway. Yeah. It's not going to give you the truth. Yeah. No, I agree with you. So that additional stiffness effect 
pushing on the sides of the pipe is part of the reason why we see that, that increased level of friction when we're going to run our casing into, into the hole. You drill a 12 and a quarter inch hole, you're going to run 9 and 5 eighths casing. Well, that's a lot stiffer than the 5 and a half inch or 5 and 7 eighths or 6 and 5 eighths drill pipe they used to, to drill the hole section. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, and I think, and, and I think that leads to a lot of um, misconceptions, if you like, going from one wellbore to another. You think that you're doing exactly the same thing. Um, you know, you're trying to learn lessons from the previous wellbore and you, you work out what your friction factors are for running the casing down. But the point is that those friction factors are actually based on something that's to do with the way you drilled the well, not the formation itself. Anyway, get on with the, get on with the presentation. So, um, so tortuosity and survey frequency, and this is, this is kind of an important point. This a little graph that we have over this side, um, the line that you see here, these little round circles, uh, this is called the Ed Stockhausen effect, incidentally. Um, um, but these little uh, dots are static surveys. The red the little circles are static surveys. The red dots are continuous inclination surveys. As you can see, we're doing, um, we're doing a slide rotate with a motor. Now, the slide rotate with a motor, um, we, are, we are taking uh, surveys at the end of each rotate section because you've basically gone flat. But what's happening is, if you look at this cumulative TD error, every time you do a slide rotate, you are, you're assuming that these static surveys are your, your, the inclination you're at, and you, that, that, that's, how, that's generally how you would build your survey. But if you look at the continuous data, you're actually missing a massive change in TVD. And when I say massive, uh, you know, in a 500 or a thousand foot build section into horizontal, and you were drilling with a motor, and you survey at the wrong points, the the least appropriate points, um, you you could end up with 20 or 30 feet of TVD error, which are sometimes the points that the directional drillers want to take the survey because it makes them it makes look them better. better. Yeah, no, no, it, it's great because I mean the, the whole point is that the the perfect scenario there would be um, if you want to drill the perfect curve, you'd be, you'd be sliding 100% of the time. Now, we don't, that, that is, that's both slow um, and um, the, the people can argue about whether sliding 100% of the time and, or doing 50-50 um, is better or worse. But the point is that, that, that building that, build, in the process of building that curve, um, you might have, you're trying to build 15s, you might put a 25 degree dog leg in there um, and there's no way a directional driller is going to survey across that slide. He's going to no, get no, no. a rash of Abuse. disagreements from the company yeah. man. And quite rightly so. But the point is it's real. And um, I, think, uh, I think with some of the more modern survey tools that we have now, these dog legs are real and we just have to accept it and, and live with them. But the point is if you know they're there, you can do something about them. Um, I think we're, we're, uh, we, shouldn't be, we shouldn't be afraid of the truth is basically what I'm trying to say. Um, and survey frequency tries to help give you that truth. If you were to take uh, this continuous data and build a new survey on that continuous data, um, then you're going to get the truth in two two respects. One, you're going to get the truth in uh, from a TVD and a well placement point of view, but you're also going to get the truth from a tortuosity point of view, but only really if you run a stiff string model. Um, so what we have here, down here, is um, in this little graph, is a TVD error. So this was uh, another SP paper. Um, but basically, we took 56 random wells, um, pardon me, from around the world. And we um, were running a mixture of motors, rotor steerables. Um, and we looked at what the TVD error per thousand, whether it's feet or meters, was. And we have this split into three. So not surprisingly, the build section's got the biggest TVD error. And what I mean is the difference between what the continuous data was telling you and what the static surveys told you. And uh, some of these errors are quite dramatic. Like you're talking about five, um, five feet of TVD error per thousand feet drilled, right? Measure depth, not TVD. It measured, it, sorry, measure depth. Yeah, but measure this is depth. TVD error for a thousand feet of measured, measured depth, measured yes, depth drilled. Sorry, should have said that, yeah. Um, but actually, geosteering is worse. And, and the reason geosteering is worse is, okay, in a build, you have something to follow. When you're geosteering, you're, you're, you're following what the, what the geologist is asking you to do. So you're nudging up, you're nudging down. If you're nudging up and nudging down and you're only surveying every 90 feet, you are missing a huge change, in, a potentially massive change in TVD. Um, and it's something you should really take care of. 
Uh, what what shocked me most was we also have errors when we're we're trying to draw tangents, right? That's people nudging in the in, in tangents and and losing it and trying to trying to get back on the, the tangent again. You're severing every ninety feet. The DD again will 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 make sure that, that it looks like you, they're on the tangent and going down according to the plan. But in reality, you can they, they can be quite far off. But the one the one surprise about all of this was this fifty six random wells was only one of them had no difference between this the the, the um, difference between the continuous what the continuous data was telling you and what the static surveys was only one so less only than two percent of wells yeah so this is real the other problem is this is not part of any kind of error model this is all because it's difficult to model this this is an addition to the, the these errors can be bigger than any TVD error that you you might get from an error model for an MWD tool for instance um, and that's that's quite frightening um, so if we, uh, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so if we go back to a previous discussion, dogleg is dogleg is a great guide for what torch to us, what 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 torch to us is. But if we look at this this um, diagram down here, you can see in blue, in this diagram, you can see that's um, the blue is the uh, the downhole um, dogleg, and the red is the bending moment. So sometimes the blue and the red follow each other. So the bending moments in the dog leg are following each other. But there's other times where the bending moments and the um, the dog leg, the dog leg's much higher than the bending moment is. So in other words, the dog leg's not, it's a guide, but it's not the absolute truth about how difficult it's going to be to get a particular tubular down that, that part of the that part of the borehole. Um, so you really need to use bending moments as opposed to, so dog legs, bending moments are uh, um, the next stage up, if you like from a tortuosity perspective compared to a dog leg. And then if you start uh, deriving your actual, an idea about your actual position in the well, so you, try, you start to try to calculate based on your weight on bit and, 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 and what your, um, the stiffness of the BHA that you're running downhole, how is it gonna sit you know, in between your, your, your borehole? In other words, work out what your effective borehole diameter is. You can work out what's called, what, what we call the cumulative elastic energy. And um, it has a, it it's it has a there's a dramatic difference in that cumulative elastic energy, um, let's call it tortuosity, between having these um, just using static ninety foot surveys, or, or sometimes people survey less frequently than that, and having this continuous data. And um, you can see that here. So this red one here is the um, the cumulative uh, elastic energy, uh, and the and the bending moments are the same for 30 foot surveys. Then you start looking at these, this green and the blue graph here. Um, so if you have high clearance, then you, your cumulative elastic energy is nearly three times bigger than this red, right? But you don't have any steps, right? Where it gets a bit scary is where you have these steep steps, which is blue lines got here. That means you've got a very large increase in energy required to move what is not even 100 feet, right? And that's where you might hang up and run out of torque and get stuck and people get, everybody gets excited on the rig. So what, what this graph is um, basically telling you is, is if you have high clearance, it doesn't, you'll have higher cumulative energy, but it doesn't really matter. Where it gets scary is where you've got low clearance. In other words, you've got a lot of tortuosity in that well and you have a high survey frequency. Then you're going to end up in situations where you have these steep cliffs, I guess you would call them, uh, mountains to climb. Um, in order to uh, ramp up the energy to get through a very small section, and then it calms down again. So it's almost like you, it's just like tight spots. You get through your tight spot, and then you carry on. Okay, I've I've got a I've got a really good question for you on this. Is if I'm looking at this, if I'm a drilling engineer, this this would scare me because it almost be one of those things that I would rather not know about and just and just move on instead of having something like this jump out at me. So what is what is really the value in in doing this to understand that you, you're doing higher higher frequency surveys um, to show that you have this this cumulative elastic energy that's that's going to be higher. Where's the value to the drilling engineer to actually requiring to do this? Because this is something that's above above and beyond what the standard practices that 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 is going to help them out. So I, I was actually hoping you could answer that, Chris. But um, <laughs> the the you asked the question, so I guess I need to answer it. Um, the, the the point there is, I think if you know up front, you can do. You can have say you're trying to run casing. You can 
run different practices. You don't want to be running a stabilizer through that section, for instance, right? Um, you don't want to be, um, you might want to rotate the pipe down as opposed to just try and push it down, uh, the, the casing down as opposed to push it down if you can. Um, I think there's a, the, pre-warned is, is pre-armed, if you like, from a, pre-warned is pre-armed, if you like, from a, 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 um, a, a drilling engineering point of view. You're not going to be sat on the rig, scratching your head, wondering what is going on. Um, the other thing is you might end up in a situation that if you if you knew that in real time before, and this is all possible, before you've even run your casing, you might have to go and ream that section because the casing is going to hang up or you're going to buckle it or break it. Um, or hopefully not break it, but buckle it, um, which is a very undesirable event. So I, I think, yes, it's scary and it's frightening. And, and uh, you know, the truth, the, the, the truth might hurt, but the truth is knowing the truth is a lot better than getting stuck. Agreed. Okay. I'm glad we agree. That's good. Um, this, so we did uh, another, another SP paper um, where we looked at tortuosity and the impact on well delivery, but looked at it from this scaled tortuosity index. Okay. Before we carry on, we've got a question from the audience. So let's, okay. let's go ahead and, and see what the, what the question is. So the question is, what is the appropriate survey frequency? Oh, that's, that's a good. Um, that, so the, there's a lot of work done on this. So, so you could, you know, you, you can have this continuous data every foot if you like, but it, it probably, it probably over stresses the truth. Um, and 10 feet is probably an appropriate survey frequency to have in a build section, perhaps, or, or if you're G staining in a tangent section. Um, if you're running a, a rotary steerable tool, that's perfectly capable of holding an inclination, um, and, a, a, and an azimuth, for instance, you could probably, you could get away with surveying less frequently than 90 feet because actually you're not going anywhere. Um, but if you don't have that continuous data to tell you you're not going anywhere. Um, so it, it, you end so up it, it's very dependent on exactly what the objectives are for that section in the well. There's no, there's no silver bullet to say every 30 feet, every 10 feet, every 90 feet, different yeah. sections of the well are going to require either more or less or, or, or less surveying frequency. Exactly. You can almost think about it from, a, from an anti-collision point of view. In the, in the top hole, anti-collision scenario, you might want to survey every 10 feet because you're that close to an offset well and you really want to make sure that you're getting away from that offset well. Um, from a tortuosity perspective and defining tortuosity, um, what I would suggest is that where you have continuous data, you pay attention to it and you use it all the time. Now, you don't need to have a survey every foot, right? In a tangent section, you're, you're, you're gaining nothing. Um, but from uh, but if you were in a, a build section or, a, or especially if you're geostaining, you definitely 90 foot surveys are not fit for purpose. So you want to go down probably to 10 feet. So it, it depends on what position you are in that well. You're quite right. So um, we tried to characterize what the good, the bad, and the ugly would be in terms of um, tortuosity. Uh, we failed dismally. Um, and we failed dismally because um, it depends. Uh, it depends. It's very, very field specific. So if you're drilling a soft beach sand, the tortuosity really doesn't matter very much. Tortuosity only really matters when you start to run out of torque in the rig. Right? Um, and that, uh, it, but that's, that's almost an extreme case. If you were drilling a really hard uh, consolidated limestone, and you have a torch as well, you're in, you, you're in a world of pain because it's really tough um, and it's really difficult to, to, uh, to run a stiff tubular through because there's no way you're just going to bash your way through it. Um, so what we find here, but what we did find was if we look at this graph here, so we said the red, we, off the top of our head, we thought the red was difficult. We thought the, the, the orange or the yellow was, was um, medium and the, the green was okay. Now the green, the funny thing is that, the, that there's this there's this purple, where my mouse is right now, uh, is a well that's got very high amount of cumulative elastic energy, but it's got very very few big steps, in its um, in in that energy, and actually they had absolutely no problems at all with this well running um, anything in it. But every time we see these really big steps, as green well for instance, they actually hung the casing up, right. And they had to pull back and, and there was, they pulled back and they reamed the hole and then they went and ran it again. Um, so 
it, it's very much field specific. But if you happen to have a couple of previous wells and you had continuous data and you could build this idea of cumulative plastic energy, you could tell what good, bad and ugly looks like because you've got all the information about how long it took you to run the casing, did you encounter any problems, what the cumulative elastic energy looks like, and you could do comparison. And then you could run this in real time and, and tell you, it would tell you up front, well, you're going to have a problem now. Um, you know, you're, you've got this spike in, in cumulative elastic energy and you need to um, either come back out or do a wash down or, or clean that hole up or come up with a new way of running your casing through what, this. What part. other parameters go into calculating the cumulative elastic energy? Is is it just is it just based on surveys? Is it like what what other what other so, aspects go into calculating that? So surveys, pipe stiffness, um, uh, surveys, pipe stiffness, bending moments, which comes out of pipe stiffness, uh, and then making assumptions about where, based on the shape of the borehole from the surveys, where that a tubular actually sits inside the borehole. So you're not assuming that you're always completely centralized. So if, if you were trying to run the pipe and you had a you had a dog leg here like that, the pipe's being pushed down, but you have another dog leg that goes back up the pipe, the well bore's going back up that way, then the well then this tubular has to bend. It's got too many touch points. Yeah. So you you're we try to take the touch points into account as well. Um so it's it's actually not particularly difficult to to uh, do the calculation and, and it's all in the paper. Uh, should anybody be excited enough to to go and look at the maths? Um, but uh, it was it was a good way of showing tortuosity. It's a bit more complicated than most of the other ways of showing tortuosity, and it's not intuitive. Um, it might be intuitive to drilling engineers a final product, but getting there is not intuitive to most drilling engineers, and it's utterly useless unless you've got high frequency data. Okay. Well, not utterly useless, but it's not nearly. It, as it's not nearly as useful. Yep. Um. Yeah, so actually you talked about a question I've already got written on the slide there. But um, yeah, so the formation, and it's totally formation dependent. So depending on your formation, you can you can end up with very large amounts of apparent friction factors is how we would describe it just now. But you'll still get your case into TD because you're just banging your way through. Um, and in other, in, in other situations, you just get hung up. There's, but in other cases, there. even getting your casing to bottom, if you have to cement that, that casing, then if you've got your casing that's going to be having multiple touch points throughout the well then the likelihood of you getting proper cement placement around that casing throughout the whole well, if your well is going doing this the whole time and your, your casing is contacting all these different points within the well mm -hmm. bore and having to bend around it, no matter what you do, you can't, you, you're not going to say you can't, but you're, the, the ability to get a proper cement job completely around that entire casing string is going to be much more challenging or the probability of getting is going to be lower yeah. than if you have a less tortuous well path where the casing is on centralizers, somewhat stabilized, somewhere, somewhat in the center of the hole where the casing has a, or the cement has a means of getting fully around the casing string. Which is why we end up in situations where we have to drill 300 feet of cement. Because we didn't get all that, we couldn't squeeze all that cement into, uh, up the drill pipe. Uh, sorry, around the, around the casing. Because it's physically blocked by the, 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 all those touch points are stopping the cement from moving. So, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's, um, it's a real problem, and obviously, from a well bore integrity point of view, then that, that that can become quite serious. So, one question that I've been asked quite a lot is, can we actually rely on this continuous data? So, the continuous data, so an MWD tool, and in fact, some uh, in fact, most receivable tools have at least three accelerometers, and an MWD tool has three magnetometers as well. But I'm not going to talk about the magnetometers; only accelerometers, um, and they, that's how you take a static survey. So you use all three uh, inclinometers and you work out where you are uh, reference to the earth, uh, reference to the Earth's gravity. It gives you an inclination and that's all fine. Now you can also, if you took a static survey, you can also with the, a long hole axis of the, uh, the inclinometer um, tell where um, tell where we are uh, from a a deviation from a known point. Now, if you're vertical and you're trying to measure the Earth's gravitational field, obviously you're in the same line as the Earth's gravitational field. You can't see anything. It's very, very insensitive to changes in inclination. So you have to be at a reasonable inclination and around 15 degrees is where continuous inclination becomes very stable. And from there on, if we look at this graph at the bottom, what we did was um, we have 11 wells, which have had gyros running them. 
the blue and the red are the expected EOUs for the MWD and the gyro, respectively. And this is a normalized... And by EOU, you mean ellipse of uncertainty. Ellipse of uncertainty, sorry. I get carried away with my survey and stuff. So ellipse of uncertainty. So um, the what we have here is we've normalized against measured depth. The TVD, the delta TVD that we see between the gyro, the continuous data, and the gyro. So with this continuous data, what we actually do is we tie it to the static. So you have a static survey, and then you fill the gaps in the static survey with the with the continuous data. Um, and you did a comp we did a comparison with that, uh, and we can see that actually we're inside what we'd expect for the casing gyro error model. Never mind the MWD error model. So yes, this. Of 15 degrees of inclination, continuous data is very good and very useful to use as an actual survey. Now, I'm not going to talk about azimuth. That's a completely different subject. Um, continuous azimuth is good, but it's not perfect. It's very poor going north-south um, because, you're again, you're you're actually in line with the Earth's magnetic field, so it's very insensitive to changes in, in direction. It's extremely good going east-west, where um, the, the, the actual magnetometer itself should read almost zero, right? So it's hugely, any change in uh, direction has a big impact on that. Um, it's like a null point. And any change off a null point is very easy to see. Any change off a max point or maximum point is very difficult to see. So that's why it's more sensitive. Um, and uh, therefore it's not used nearly as much. The continuous azimuth is more of a guide for our, our DD friends to steer the well, is really what it's, what okay. it's all about. We've, so, got, we've got a question. Yes, so please. I'm excited. Where's, where's, where's the question? There it is. Your geosteering, why would TVD accuracy be important? Ah, now that's a very good question. So, yes, your geosteering. So you might have you might have some really, really sweet little LWD tools in the well, or you might not. But the point is your geosteering. Um, the point is that, that when we geosteer, we expect that geological data that we collect to be the truth. And it is for where you are in that well bore. The problem is that if you don't care about your TVD, you take all that information and say you're running something clever like a deep resistivity tool. Um, you've got this beautiful section along the well bore of the top and bottom of your reservoir and, or different layers within your reservoir. Um, if your TVD is wrong, you take that, this might be to you, this is, this, is the, um, this is the absolute truth about what your well bore looks like. You take that and you stick it in your reservoir model and you tie everything to this piece of information inside your reservoir model. If that TVD is wrong, then the rest of your the rest of your reservoir model is wrong too. You put it in the wrong place in your reservoir model, and then you drill the next well, and your TVD might be higher or lower because you've got an error, um, and now you're confused. Now, now you're, what you thought was a relatively flat and uh, non-dipping formation suddenly got what looks like faults in it or dips, or it becomes very, very confusing very quickly, and you can end up in a situation and it's happened before where people abandon fields because, or they abandon drilling more wells in a field because their production keeps going down because they, they, they just don't understand the reservoir model. It doesn't make sense anymore. And uh, you, you might think that's a bit of a stretch. It's, it's not a bit of a stretch. It actually happens. Um, and when you come back to it and you start applying, if you've got continuous data, you apply the continuous data, the geology makes sense. Whereas previously, the geology simply didn't make any sense. Your dips don't line up. You know, um, you've got water running uphill, and tying some of the, tying some of the all of that together might be able to also give some some indication as to why maybe on some wells in the same field produce a lot more or a lot less than other wells. Maybe the wells being placed in a different horizon that you didn't think is maybe was less productive, but you you have that error in TVD, and and if the gammas are relatively similar to those different zones, but you just placed it. 20, 30, 40, 50 feet. I'm not sure what the, like how much you can have, but based mm -hmm. on what you've shown already, you can have pretty significant differences in your, in your TVD error. Yeah. So if you placed it in the wrong horizon, maybe that well doesn't produce that much. And it's, it's not just that it's a bad rock or not that they're, and, and then if that gets tied back into your reservoir model, that this well produces really well, this well produces next to it, but it's actually up here and it, and it actually produces poorly, then that can also screw up your, your reservoir model as well. Well, definitely. And, and when I previously worked as a consultant, um, a long time ago, um, I did actually end up in a, in, in a situation looking at, at somebody's um, a reservoir model and I, there were geological impossibilities everywhere and there were faults all over the place. And the, 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 these faults, so they're running a lot of LWD, but the LWD was not telling them, was not making any sense inside the reservoir model. 
So they were actually tying themselves in knots by by ignoring these these differences in TVD. So you're right. I, I think it can be it can be very detrimental to um, almost a company's bottom line if they don't take this seriously. Okay. I think we have another question. Okay. What is the centralization recommendation depending on tortuosity? Oh. That is a, a very interesting question, and I think I'm going to borrow a saying from Ross and say, well, it depends. Yes. The, obviously, it's, it's, it's recommended that if you're in a medium or high angle hole, pretty much any deviated hole, you need to, you need to centralize the casing fairly, fairly consistently, typically one centralizer per joint in order to give the casing that amount of standoff. In the vertical section of the hole, you can probably get away with utilizing maybe fewer centralizers because in the lower angle section of the hole, there's less deviation, there's less points for the, for the well to be contacted. The, if, you, if you don't know what the, what the tortuosity is in the well bore, I think you have to assume that you're going to require centralizers anyway if you need to get a good cement job because we all know there's dozens of papers that have been written, there's tons of literature that, sh that say that if, if the casing is sitting on the low side of the hole, the, channel, the, the cement is going to channel on the high side and you're going to get no isolation whatsoever. And not getting a good cement job is going to cause nothing but problems when you go to drill out that casing string and go to drill your next hole section. Um, where, where I think it could come in to be interesting is if, if, if the degree of tortuosity increases your level of friction from being able to slack off your casing string to TD versus maybe requiring you to have to rotate your casing or liner string to TD, then that is going to change the centralizers that you're going to be required to have on your casing string. Because from a torque and drag perspective, you're using free-floating centralizers they, if they are, even if you rotate the casing inside those centralizers, those centralizers are still sliding along the low side of the hole, and that is still static friction. You're not able to utilize that, that mechanism of, of overcoming static axial friction through rotation if the centralizer is still contacting the side of the hole. So in that case, you're just rotating the casing, the centralizer is sliding, and you're, you're really not doing anything. You're not getting that benefit. So if you're in a position where you do have to rotate the casing or liner to get the TD, then that would tell you that you need to have centralizers that are going to be fixed to the pipe that rotate with the pipe. So you are able to utilize that phenomenon of, of converting your axial drag into torque. Mm -hmm. But then that brings up the other problem is, of does your top drive have the, cap have the torque capability to rotate that string down? Do your, do your, do your connections both on your running string if you're running a liner or the connections on the tubulars for your liner or casing have the capability of handling that torque as well. In, in some ERD wells, we have to utilize some other techniques like, like casing flotation to reduce the weight of the pipe that allow us to, to rotate the pipe within the limitations of the rig and of the, of the connection. So it's, it's really going to depend, but understanding what the, what's going to be required to get that casing or liner to TD from a torque and drag perspective is going to drive the, the, the recommendations or the, what type of centralizer you need. But even if I was in a well that, that had a high degree of tortuosity, I would still run centralizers if I knew I was, if I was gonna, I was gonna be cementing it, or if there was a risk of differ, differential sticking, even if I wasn't cementing it, because you gotta keep that pipe off the side of the hole to both get a good cement job if you're cementing it, or keep it off the side of the hole so you don't leave it across a permeable zone and potentially get differentially stuck. Yeah, and I think um, the important point there is you can only do any of that if you know you've got the problem. Um, what I'm suggesting here is that, 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 would, that there's a way to know that you have a problem up front before you've gone and done that. Because if you're going to be changing um, your centralizers, you want to know up front. You don't want to be having to pull casing out. And because you, you normally can't do this on the fly. Yeah. Getting those types of, getting that, getting that equipment out, whether it's the specific centralizers that, gets, that get attached to the pipe, which there's numerous vendors out there that can do that or utilizing different casing connections that have the torque capability to rotate. Mm -hmm. Those aren't things that you can normally just do at the rig in the field. They, they require some degree of planning up front to understand that that's going to be required. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I think you can look at previous data and come up with some ideas about what, what might be happening in your future well. Um, assuming you're drilling the same formations, et cetera, with the similar BHAs and mud, et cetera. But Actually, the, probably, probably the most interesting part of all of this is, uh, like anything else, if you're watching and the DD knows that they're being watched in terms of you're taking this continuous data and you're actually looking for, um, we're actually looking for um, a, a situation where uh, 
they know that they're being watched, if you like. Then they tend to do a better job and they don't go and have a wee cup of tea halfway through or a cup of coffee halfway through uh, halfway through a stand uh, while, they're, while, they're, while they're drilling. I'm not suggesting all DDs do that, but it can happen. Um, the more the more you're in control of what's, and the more people are watching what's happening on the rig, the better the rig does at producing the actual well path that's needed. And um, what I'm kind of saying here is we have continuous data on an awful lot of wells and we should we should be using that as a, a proxy to um, to get the best that we can in terms of well water choice. Um, I am running out of time, so I'm going to have to uh, I'm going to have to start moving on a little bit. What I'm going to talk about is uh, what I said I was going to talk about at the start of all of this, which is the impact of well delivery. Um, basically, what I'm saying is that that if you increase tortuosity, you get a linear response up to a, a certain period, and then the thing starts going exponential to the point where you just cannot run your uh, your casing anymore. So let's get straight into it. You're running uh, casing and completions. There are rig constraints. We just talked about some of the rig constraints. Can you actually rotate the casing in the first place? Um, can you damage the casing running it in hole? I think we can absolutely say that you can damage the casing running it in hole. And um, if you have an intelligent completion, and this is this seems relatively um, obvious to me, but if you have an intelligent completion and you want you have uh, zonal isolation and you want these um, uh, sliding um, doors to open or shut, if you bend them, they won't open or shut. And um, if you don't know that that dog leg's there and you don't know you bent it, you've you've just spent millions of dollars on an intelligent completion that is no longer intelligent. It's uh, the most uh, most expensive thing that goes into the hole. Absolutely. And then uh, they uh, always have swell packers on either side. And those swell packers normally have about, about a quarter of an inch clearance between the outside of the hole or the inside of the casing that they're going into, whether it's an open hole completion or whether it's going, it's a going inside, inside a, a liner that's already run into the hole. And I'm imagining that and any any high dog legs that the, that that seeing is also going to be a means of, of of jamming and getting stuck. Absolutely, and and even even well, we'll come on to the next one actually. Um, we look at artificial lift, which is probably the most sensitive to um, to dog legs. So um, there is a so both from a pump guide's point of view, you want that in a nice tangent section in the wellbore. In fact, you generally build a tangent section into your your design in order that you can you can put the um, put the pump guide in the right place. Um, if you have any sort of dog leg over that pump guide, you will wear them out so fast compared to you expect to design life. Then you've got a work over, right? And this well might not start again after you've done the work over. You just don't know. It's all a bit of a gamble. Um, and if you have the data and you have the, the information up front, we could do something about it. Um, and from an ESP perspective, um, ESPs are, they might be able to go around a 10 degree dog leg, but they're not designed to sit in one and operate in one. They're just a succession of, of um, turbines and shafts and a motor uh, that will very easily be um, bent out of shape and the design life. One degree dog, an unplanned one degree dog leg in a tangent section for uh, um, ESP could easily reduce the life of the ESP by 25%, right? That's yeah. an expensive business. They're and difficult to put in and they're, they're expensive to, to buy in the first place. And I know in my previous life as a drilling engineer, we always looked at the tangent section and uh, for, for, for a pump was essentially a place that we would be able to get caught up if we fell behind the line. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, you know, it has, it has a real impact. And I've been, you know, um, uh, I've been looking at that for, for some time and it's, it's a real problem. Um, in terms of well placement, I think we've talked about this a lot already. 90 foot surveys miss a lot of TVD change, not in a tangent section generally. But when you're building, especially when you're geostaining, this is a little US land example, 10 foot uh, TVD change between the continuous data and the static data. Um, and all of this really matters because your LWD is a 2D model, right? It's a 2D slice of your wellbore. All reservoir models are 3D, right? You get the TVD wrong, putting into your 3D model for your reservoir, your reservoir model is now wrong. Um, and I believe that is it. Yes. See, I told you to hurry up. And just in time, 30 seconds left. Well, thank you very much, Ross. That was very interesting. Um, and thank you, everybody that tuned in. If there are any other questions that we weren't able to answer, we'll, we'll, we will definitely try to go back and answer all of those questions. Um, and if you have any other questions for Ross or myself, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. We appreciate everybody that tuned in to watch. It was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you, Ross. No, thank you. I 